Hey everybody, welcome back to Laptop Seniors. Today we're going to be talking about Argentina. We had a few notes because we lived in Argentina and Uruguay and Panama, obviously, that uh, could you compare the three? And we were about in the process sort of doing that after we kind of put away all the Portugal stuff to work on later for you. Um, and a big thing happened in Argentina. This is a major thing and it impacts retiring there. So I just thought I'd go through it and then Viv's going to come and help me out. And we're going to talk about Buenos Aires and Argentina, but mainly Buenos Aires um, because, you know, we spent so much time there. But, you know, for this, it's just going to be about sort of where we are and where Argentina is if you wanted to retire there, because that's what we talk about. We talk about retirement. Now, um, we lived in South America in 2009 at the time. And this is where it really gets important you know, for a retirement point of view. When we were down there after I retired, the exchange rate was five Argentinian pesos. So you get five pesos for every one dollar, five to one. The current exchange rate right now is 357 pesos to one dollar. That's the official rate. And, you know, it's been that way for a while because price controls, they're trying to hold it there. But we have friends uh, who uh, live in Buenos Aires. They've lived there for a long time, Argentinians who used to live in Canada for many, many years, had a career there and then went back. What they were telling us is the official rate, and it's been that way for a while, for a couple months now, but it's a thousand to one. You get 1,000 pesos, Argentinian pesos, for one US dollar. I mean, that's crazy. At the inflation rate that it's going right now, which is 185% a year, that's the official rate by like the IMF and world things when they look at Argentina, they pay, you know, they peg it at around 180, 185% a year. That's where things are at the moment. And if you were a banker, you'd go, oh my God, this is awesome to do arbitrage against. And I'll explain that because you would not probably do arbitrage because of the political situation, the way it's been, maybe going forward to be okay. That's a huge wild card here. But if you're a retirement person and you want to do retirement arbitrage, and I'll explain what that is, it's a great time right now to do that and be thinking of that. But there's certainly some risks involved. So let me go through some of those things and then we'll sit and talk about um, with you know, when Viv comes over about uh, Argentina and uh, Buenos Aires. It is a great country. About 100 years ago, if you don't know, if you took the top 10 countries of the world, who's the most successful, best GDP, people have a lot of money and all that sort of stuff, what countries are smoking? Argentina is in the top 10 because they're so big. It's a huge country and a lot of landmass, a lot of resources, a lot of everything. And people are smart, well-educated, all that, everything you'd ever want. But about 100 years ago, the Perón government sort of kicked in, Juan Perón, Evita Perón. And it was a very, and I'm not going to get into politics here, I'm just kind of laying it out the way it is. They're very, very socialistic. Um, and um, essentially, they took the country down a different path um, toward a giving away stuff for free, a lot of social um, nets beyond normal. And anyway, they bankrupted the country. Long story short, country went, you know, went bankrupt and it is where it is now. 185% inflation rate. They have no federal reserves. They have no money in reserve. You know, they don't have any gold. They have very little gold. They have hardly any US dollars, nothing hardly to trade with. So it's a dire situation. For those hundred years, the government there were called Peronistas, which is, you know, from Juan Perón. They've been in power for 28 years. And then finally, the veneer started to crack in 21 after COVID, when everything started to come back to life again, where there it didn't, okay? And now what just happened, they had a federal election for president of the country, and Javier Mille, he won. And he's a libertarian in the true sense, not necessarily in the U.S. or Canadian sense, but he's a free market guy, he's a freedom guy, he's free speech, he's free everything. It's basically, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. The state shouldn't, you know, enter into anything. So he's the new person in power um, by a big vote. I mean, you know, this was a 
massive sea change in the, in the people going from here, whoa, way over there. Um, so that's the wild card is like, where's that going to go? What, what's going to happen if you're thinking about retiring and going there? Is that going to end up good or is it going to end up bad? Now, he doesn't have a whole lot of other congressmen, if you will, or senators, you know, that kind of thing in Congress, in their government uh, on his side. So he's, he's you know, uh, I, I forget the numbers, but let's just say there's 300 politicians in the federal government. In his party, there's like six or seven, maybe eight. So hard to push through legislation, but he is the president and he does have power. He does have power over the Justice Department, immigration, and a bunch of other different things that he can just do without anybody else. And, uh, you know, he stands and ran on a particular bunch of things. So let me go through them. Western media portrays this guy as a nutcase, okay? And, and you could certainly easily get that impression. He's blunt, he's outspoken, and sometimes he's pretty crude when he was running for office. Like he would, you know, he would call somebody flat out a shithead, you know, like you know, on, on national TV. And you go like, whoa, dude, you want, want to reel that back in? And, and, and things that would be way worse than that, okay? So he didn't care. His, uh, his battle cry was something about, I, I didn't come here to lead lambs, I came here to lead lions. And so he wants to kind of blow everything up and start from scratch because he thinks it's 100% totally broken. There are too many people working for the government. They don't do anything. There's a lot of corruption, you know, in the government, uh, you know, hands with people working. I mean, again, that's not me. That's his pushing and what people responded to, to, to vote him in. He wants to get closer to the United States and maybe even flip the pesos out and start using U.S. dollars, just like Panama does. But one of the big things is he, he wants to have a closer relationship with the United States, doesn't want to have a relationship with Russia or with China, you know, as far as government, doesn't mind if companies trade with them, but he doesn't want to have a government relation. Um, and, you know, as you may or may not know, China has been going into many countries in South and Central America and building projects and doing deals. But then, you know, it's kind of like loans, but then they call the loans in and that's becoming problems for different countries because they can't pay the loan back. And then all of a sudden China owns the infrastructure, stuff like that. And I think there's a little bit of that, you know, going on in Panama. I remember when uh, we're watching TV, um, one of the Panamanian channels, and, uh, you know, they were going through that as a documentary. And it was like, oh, that's interesting, because I, I didn't know any of that. Anyway, point being why I'm mentioning the um, wanting the closeness with the United States. The United States, if you reverse it and look down at South America and Central America, and you see a lot of countries all of a sudden moving away from the U.S. and flipping toward China to see this big, giant, respected country in South America all of a sudden wanting to be your friend, I would guess that they're going to look down in the State Department and CIA probably too and look and think, you know what? We need to help this guy. We need to help this guy get that country out of its dire position. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen, but to me, it just seems kind of logical. Like, you'd want to help the person that wants to have a relationship with you, knowing that there's a monstrous amount of resources um, in Argentina because it's such a massive country. It's, you know, it's probably, I mean, if, I guess if you looked at the land mass, it's probably maybe one third of all of South America, certainly a quarter easily. One of the other things that he, he's been espousing is he wants to take back the Falkland Islands. British Island, British took it back, but even the Guardian now is saying, because they're, you know, mimicking what uh, Javier, the new president, is, was saying, and even the Guardian in London is like, you know, maybe it's time for England. It's so far away from England, you know, colonialism type thing from another century. Maybe it's time to give it up and let them have it. My guess is this is what's going to happen, or at least it could happen, because this is something I saw about 10 years ago, and I've never seen it since, ever. And no one's ever mentioning it right now, so this may be a first to you. There is a huge oil field in the water, kind of like North Sea oil, where you got to, you know, put the floating, uh, you know, oil rigs, uh, you know, out in the water and, uh, you know, sink them down with the big pontoons and drill for oil out in the ocean. 120 miles northwest, I just don't know how far west, you know, if you go really west, all of a sudden you're in Argentina. So somewhere between Argentina 
and the Falkland Islands, north of the Falklands, okay, 120 miles, which is international territory, there is a 325 million barrel oil field sitting out there. Now, you tap that oil wheel if you're Argentina, um, and you start bringing that oil online, and all of a sudden your financial troubles as a country, whew, over with. But how do they get you know, the oil rigs out there? To me, it seems like a, a perfect thing for them to do and you know, go to England and go, tell you what, why don't we do this? This is a burden for you, the Falklands. Why don't, you know, we'll take it. But in return, let's not fight about the oil that's been, you know, in between us for all this time. Why don't, you know, you, England, like BP or, or, or Total, I think BP is a British company. Here, you come in and you pull, pull the oil out of the water, do the rigs and everything. And as countries, we'll split it 50-50 or 30-30 and the oil company gets a third. Something. Something like that. I'm sure a deal could be made. All of a sudden, this is a really prosperous country again, and the inflation super subsides, and it goes back to being great the way it was 100 years ago. But that's not now. Now we're talking about retirement. Now, I mentioned that the media, the Western media, has been portraying him as a crazy person, sort of like a Trump guy. He's, he's Trump for South America. Again, like I mentioned, crude. Um, you know, stupid, in your face, and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, on a, whew, man, I don't know scale, on a 1 to 10 scale, you're going to put him at a 10. Okay? Crazy guy. But if you go farther, okay, things start to look a little bit different for things that they don't really tell you very much about. And so I'm going to actually go through it. And I'm not going to... And it may seem like I'm sticking up for him. I'm not sticking up for him. I just hate it when somebody only gives you one side. They don't want to give you the other side because it you know, doesn't f fit the narrative going either way. But like, you know, certainly in North America, each party and people do that. They make the other portray the other one as, as nuts or racist or something weird. And the other one does the same thing with, you know, other adjectives. So let me tell you things that you probably don't know. He holds not one, but two master's degrees in economics. He's a proponent of the Austrian School of Economics. Now, the Austrian School of Economics you know, versus the Keynesian School of Economics, Lord Keynes, it, the difference is, is that the current one that everybody uses, Keynes, you know, espouses that, yeah, you can run big deficits and everything will be fine. Well, clearly, that's not true. It, you know, at some point, it catches up with you and you've got a problem. The Austrian School of Economics is essentially like your family. You try to live within your means. If you get too far out, boom, your house is gone. So you don't want to do that. You try to not have very much debt and, and all that sort of stuff. That, in a nutshell, that's pretty much it. He was chief economist for a bunch of large financial hedge funds and companies, chief economist for HSBC Bank, um, he's written numerous books. He's been an economics professor, you know, at, in, at university for, I don't know, 18, 20 years, somewhere in there. So when it comes to economics, it's like, okay, all of a sudden that 10 doesn't look like a 10 on the crazy scale. He looks somewhere a lot lower. The other kicker in this is as an economics professor, and he would go abroad and teach this and show other governments. Margaret Thatcher, by the way, was his hero, thought she was awesome. That's, you know, that's what he, he, he you know, that's his hero, okay? But his specialty is taking countries where the economies are dead and turning them into growth. Growth, as an economist, was his specialty, is his specialty. So you go like, well, what does that fit? Well, it kind of fits the country he's now running. So it's pretty much, I mean, the way I look at it, it's like, this is the right guy at the right time overseeing a country if you only care about the economics and you only care about getting the inflation rate down and getting the economy rolling and having jobs and all that stuff. Because a lot of the young people in that country who voted for him, he got 50% of the vote of people under 30. Almost all of them don't have any jobs. They're all unemployed and they want work. Um, you know, and they've you know, flipped from being a voting for a socialist party to voting for his party, which again is libertarian. Yeah, I don't know, but to me, it's like, you know, he's kind of in the middle. That's what you're kind of walking into at the moment if you want to retire 
in Argentina. Now, Buenos Aires is what most people think of when they think of Argentina. Buenos Aires is a massive city. It's like 15 million people in the greater Buenos Aires area. But the reason I mention the whole country is only something like 45 million people. And 15 of those million people are in the Buenos Aires area, okay? So 30 million people are in the rest of the country. The rest of the country is massive. So if you wanted to live in a smaller town and you know, not, you know, into the you know, craziness of, of uh, Buenos Aires and everything that, you know, can go on there. If you wanted to go somewhere that would be like, we were, we've been talking about Panama so much that if you want to go to a town like Boquete or Chitre, you know, that kind of thing outside of like Panama City or even Coronado, you could find that in Argentina and be away from Buenos Aires and, you know, and live a nice life because of, I'm going to come all the way back to that now, because of the arbitrage of the money, the retirement arbitrage. Now, what is that? What am I talking about? Retirement arbitrage is basically what people do when they go to Panama. It's on their list. It just isn't as great as it is in, in Argentina. They do the same thing. And you hear it all the time. If you watch videos on YouTube about Bali and about Eastern Europe, and Malaysia. What arbitrage is, in a nutshell, is it's an anomaly between the price of two things, okay? So, you know, on, on Wall Street, if a stock normally goes for, and I'll make this up, like if Microsoft typically goes for $100, if that's what it's worth, that's what it typically sells for, and it's usually $100. They have computer systems that are watching all the stocks, and when something gets a little bit out of whack, and it may only be for 30 seconds, if something happens where all of a sudden that thing drops to 80 bucks, their automatic stuff kicks in and buys a ton of it, knowing that it's going to go back up to 100. It should, it's not going to stay at 80, okay? It's looking for moments like that where what you have dollars buys you way more than it should. That in a nutshell is sort of arbitrage. So when you put that over to retirement, arbitrage is taking US dollars or Canadian dollars or euros and taking them into an area of the world where everything is cheaper. And ideally, the currency there is falling. It, what it can buy is falling because of inflation. Turkey is another one of those countries. A lot of people have been buying property in Turkey because what was $200,000, say, in American money, dropped to like $100,000 in American money because of inflation in, I forget what Turkey has, I think it's a Turkish lira, because if it was 200,000 200, US dollars, it's say, I don't know, four or five years ago, before the inflation started to kick in, that might have translated into, I'll just make this up, it might have translated into 300,000 lira, 200,000 US, 300,000 lira. But because of the inflation, what ended up happening, all of a sudden that apartment is 400,000 lira, but it's only $100,000. The dollar becomes super strong. So that's the situation. New guy taken over, definitely a wild card, super high inflation. That's brutal if you have your money there. The main thing you don't do, just like our friends, they don't have their money there. They have bank accounts, but there's hardly anything in them. They keep all their money out of the country, which is what most people who are wealthy do that actually are Argentinian and live in Argentina. They keep their money in Miami, uh, in the U.S. or some other place, or they actually keep it next door in Uruguay. Um, lots of people from Argentina have their money in Uruguay, um, different currency, safer, stable, and all that sort of stuff. Now, I'm going to have Viv come in and we're going to talk about Argentina and specifically Buenos Aires and what it's like there. Okay, we're joined by the lovely Vivian. All right. Hi there. <laughs> so um, we're going to now talk more about Buenos Aires and, you know, from our time there and give, try to give you a little bit of a feel, not super comprehensive. We'll do that in the video probably when we compare... Buenos Aires, basically Argentina against Uruguay and then against Panama because a lot of people have asked us to do that because we've been in all three countries and are familiar with all three and they're all... We've been around. Yeah, they're all pretty good uh, retirement places 
in their own right for different reasons. Uh, we have a particular favorite, at least I do, certainly. Um, but a lot depends on your situation. You know, like um, if I was retiring right now at the age of 62, I would not pick what I would pick right now. I would pick a different country. That's a whole other video. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> so subscribe and, and click that bell so you'll get the yeah. notification when it pops. Yeah, because you know, a little bit of that has to do with gambling a little bit more. I don't mean gambling with money or, or gambling with your life. I mean... Oh, he's so cryptic. Yeah, well, it's, it's more <laughs> of, you know, wild cards. See, you know, the older you get, the less wild cards you, you, you kind of want to deal with. You know, when you're younger, yeah, sure, bring them on. Anyways. But getting back to Buenos Aires, yes, yes. Uh, one of the main reasons why we have so much inside information is because we have such great friends who live in Buenos Aires. I'd say over the last 20 years, uh, Pat and I have gotten to be very close with them, especially after we lived in South America one year. So we were living in Uruguay and spent a lot of time in BA with them, uh, BA Buenos Aires. We grew quite a close connection and trust me, those two are really on the pulse of what is going on in Buenos Aires. And it's neat talking to them because, uh, you know, like so many other things, it doesn't match what you see in the newspapers oh, or, yeah. or you see on TV. Although, actually, for a lot of years, yeah, I'd say the last few years, other than the election that just happened, you rarely see Argentina in the news. It was kind of like the country didn't exist. So, you know, mainly the only news that you would hear would be from them. But now with that election, it's like, whoa, mm. hello, they're you know, right, you know, right back up in the, in the headlines and right up in your face. Which, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you're going to retire in Argentina, I mean, there's a lot of different choices. Most people would consider Buenos Aires. Some people would consider Mendoza. We haven't been to Mendoza, but it's, you know, on our bucket list to go to Mendoza. I was surprised at how large it is because I thought it would be like a two, three hundred thousand population town, mostly vineyards, maybe not even that big. That's what I was kind of assuming. I mean, what did you think? Well, I think most people want to go there for the wine, not for the size. <laughs> no, no, I know, but I mean, you just assume it's mostly, I was thinking Napa, mostly vineyards and a little, yeah. you know, sort of a little kind of a cute little yeah, town. that's true. But it, the town's like over a million, so I think it's kind of pushing like a million and a half. And, and it's beautiful in the pictures and really cool and probably cheaper than going to Buenos Aires. Well, one town we visited when we were there was San Antonio de Reco. Yeah, that's cowboy town. That's what the gauchos. <laughs> it was a very small, out-in-the-country town where, yeah, they have a gaucho festival every year, I think. They're still doing it every year, but it was unbelievable. Yeah, it's one of those things where uh, the gauchos show up, and I don't know, there's probably five or 6,000 of them. They parade. With, with, with 15, 20,000 horses. <laughs> oh, my God. And, uh, and the horses are so well-trained. They don't even have bridles on them or ropes or anything. They just... You know, they'll give them commands and you see like 10 horses turn at once. We're going to send them on Buenos Aires. You know, some of the good points are if you are there and you're living in Buenos Aires, you don't need a car. Um, they have great city transportation. They got a subway system. I believe it was the first subway system in the Americas before New York City. Uh, it's a good subway system, buses and all that other stuff. You like you don't need a car. And in case you don't know, Buenos Aires is a huge city. How many million yeah. in the population? 15 million. Fif and it's home to the widest street in the whole world, the entire world. Yeah. So this street, which in English we would call it the 9th of July, it's Avenida Nueve de Julio, mm -hmm. <laughs> if I said that right. Um, it's almost 460 feet wide. I'm not sure now how many lanes of traffic. I did know at one yeah, time, but I think it's, it's insane. I think it's 14 lanes. There's no way on a typical light that you can walk from one side to the other. You have to only, like, you can just make it to the middle, and then you got to wait there for the light. And there are boulevards to, to allow people to stop and pause and wait for the next light change to yeah, get across. It's crazy. It's kind of like running for chairs when, you know, when the music stops. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, the architecture is beautiful, some of the old-time stuff. It looks like Paris. You know, it's been called the, the Paris of South America. 
And there's good reason for that. O open outdoor cafes and just the architecture itself looks like that French architecture where the building goes up and then there's that curve going up to the roof. Mm -hmm. You see that all the time, you know, in Paris. Same thing down there. It's, uh, it, it's very, very cool. Um, you know, it just reminded me of what uh, our friends down there w were explaining. We started talking about the economy and what people uh, are dealing with down there. I think, you know, with 185% inflation each year, like how do people survive and how do they do it? And he was explaining many years ago, because it's been going on for so long that the economy has been so messed up and they can't trust the peso and all that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. that having a house is sort of not on their agenda or a big home with a lot of possessions and things. They have small places. Definitely not a big home. Yeah, they so they have small places, just, you know, it's a place to sort of to live, to sleep, you know, make, maybe make a meal, but they live their entire life out at restaurants and coffee shops, mm -hmm. outside with friends, meeting up. As he was saying this, I was thinking, man, a lot of North America is starting to turn that way also because particularly young people, certainly in Canada, and you know, a lot of the complaints are now coming from the US and Europe too, that they can't afford a home. Like there's no entry. There's no entry to get into a home or even sometimes even an apartment. They're too expensive. And all oh, that I stuff. thought you were going towards people who were living outside of their home more than they were before. Well, yeah, that, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying if you can't have a home, so you don't, you know, that dream, the American dream, the, the Argentinian the big house dream, all of that with stuff. With the white picket fence. <laughs> gone. You know, the dream is now, okay, let me get into something small and I can spend all my discretionary money because I don't want to save anything because the peso is going to turn whatever I save you know, two months from now, it's going to lose 10%. Another two months, and it's lost half of half mm -hmm. what its buying power. I need to get rid of it now. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go get a coffee mm -hmm. and a croissant and that type of stuff. That's the thinking. Um, you know, and it works for them. I, and know, they're very thing. social. Like, their whole community is a part of their life. You yeah. know, sometimes in North America, you don't even know the person who lives next door to you. And that's that's kind of sad because community is important. And when they're out and about, one of the things that, that's a huge plus is the food. The restaurants are great. And when we were there, they were, mm. you know, they were really reasonably priced. Mm. And we were getting some unbelievable steaks. The other thing that's really good, and I did look it up. And I'll show it to you as we're doing this, so just throw it over the top. You can rent an apartment, a nice apartment, for mm. pretty much Panama City prices. At, you know, and you, you, I was looking, and you're like, wow, this looks good. What's that? Oh, it's only 800 bucks a month. And these were furnished. So if you're there for like the long haul, you're not renting a furnished place, so it becomes even cheaper. You got reasonable priced housing, you got reasonably priced restaurants. And then because of the inflation and you're American or Canadian or Euros, everything just got way cheaper for you than the people who were living there. So, you know, as I was saying, you know, earlier in the front part of this, everything is really out of whack and terrible if you are an Argentinian who is sort of grown up and stuck in Argentina and you live there and you have to deal with this and it's been going on for years and years and years. But if you're coming there from somewhere else and your money is somewhere else, whew, man, it's like it's like hitting a unicorn. Our friends are always telling us, well, the last few years anyway, they feel like they live for free down there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were just saying they buy an avocado and when they convert the money, it's about what? 40 cents and we just and went to Costco and it was six six for six bucks. It was a buck a piece So you're going and that's the... Costco when you go to a supermarket You could be paying easily two dollars for a single avocado. Yeah, and that's uh, and that that's Costco in Florida we're, Right this moment. We're in Florida. So yeah, I know we move around a lot <laughs> uh, so a dollar in Florida 40 cents in Argentina Easily two bucks in Canada, two, two, two and a quarter. At least to yeah. buy a single avocado. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's what she was talking about, a single avocado. Yeah. As an example. Yeah. So 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of good things about Argentina. We could go on forever, but I, you know, I'm pretty sure you kind of get the idea. It, it, it's uh, it's cheap for retirement there, and it's got a ton of things going for it. And there's a huge amount of cultural things in Buenos Aires too, and in Argentina also. But the pending issue now is that they are looking at converting the local currency to the U.S. dollar, right? Yeah. So we don't know what's going to happen with that. But I know when, when some of the European countries converted to the euro, you know, it was really hard on the people of the country. It wasn't exactly a fair dollar-for-dollar dollar conversion. In Estonia, what happened was the prices went from the Estonian dollar to the euro. It just flipped from one to the other. The number didn't change, but the salaries were converted, which ended up being a lot lower. Now, I know the economy has recovered a lot since then, but that was hardship. You know, that is a wild card. You don't know what's going to happen uh, down there, you know, when, if they do, uh, I guess the guy, I just read like a, a couple hours ago that he's, he's sort of backpedaling on that part a little bit uh, of, flip, um. you know, and maybe because it's like, okay, I can't do this right out of the gate because he, he had a lot of things that he wanted to do ultimately, but you can't do them all, you know, and he, it seems like... Well, fairly... especially if you don't have the rest of the government behind you 100%. Yeah, but he's also tempered, you know, so he seems like a pretty reasonably thoughtful guy, and so it's like, okay, this is all I wanted to do, boom, 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 and, you know, vote for me, I'm going to pu- try to pull these off, now i got to start going one at a time here of what I can pull off, mm-hmm. and that might be one of those things that, you know, somewhere down the road, mm-hmm. um, you know, to alleviate the lack of trust in the peso. Because you know, Argentinians, I think most people around the world have no trust in the peso at all. But again, if you're retiring there, doesn't matter to you. You're not converting your stuff. You know what I mean? You're going to come in with U.S. dollars. What, what do you care? If you're considering actually buying property in Buenos Aires, and I imagine it's true for most of Argentina, uh, you have to be prepared to pay for the property right on the spot. Like, I don't think you're getting a mortgage there. So it's an interesting scenario that happens when you're buying property. Yeah, you just have to move the money into the country. Um, the way they do it, the way our friends explained it, it was like, oh, really? That actually happens? Um, if you were the person buying my place, you would show up with literally a suitcase and probably two bodyguards with guns. And there would be a suitcase full of money. <laughs> yeah. So if it was like a six hundred thousand dollar home, you're going to show up with six hundred thousand U.S. dollars or whatever that equivalent is in pesos, which means you're going to probably show up with like a tractor trailer worth of <laughs> worth of paper if they were pesos. Anyway, and the two guys, you know, with guns are going to be protecting you because of all the money. There'll be another person that there that is a you know, from the government that's going to be watching the transaction. And there'll be other people in the room. Anybody who has a lien of any sort on that home, owed money, they're in the room too. The guy opens the suitcase. Well, what do you need? 3000 bucks. Show me the bill. There it is. You agree? Yes. Okay, here's your 3000 Get out. Yeah. <laughs> next person. Next person. Yeah. Next person. The government person is writing all that down. <laughs> it gets down to the end. Okay, here's your 526000 50 cents of money, there's the deed, you're out. Yeah. You know, I don't own it anymore, mm-hmm. it's yours, and uh, and now I need two bodyguards because I'm sitting there with a half a million dollars in cash. What do I do? Yeah, that's the way it works. Isn't that mm-hmm. wild? We're getting off though, but it's interesting. It's interesting stuff. Some of the bad points, there is crime, and the crime has increased mm-hmm. um, because as the economy has gone down and more and more people uh, I think it's like 50% now are under the poverty line. And the poverty line there is a lot lower than, you know, in the U.S. Mm-hmm. or Canada or, or, or Europe. So, you know, people are hurting. So clearly they're going to go out and, you know, and, and commit crime and rob and because they're going to try to, um, you know, have some money to have their family eat. or Just or provide whatever. for their family. Yeah. Not condoning it, but, I mean, you, you can yeah. see it. It happens. That's one of the... Uh, and it's also what the president, the new president guy, you know, what he ran on is that when you go down 
Okay, maybe this is politics. I don't mean it to be politics, but I'm just sort of explaining. When you go down the road of having debt and you, you know, in very socialistic countries, the outcome is, is that the money starts to disintegrate of its value, but your salaries don't move very much. And when that happens, more and more people start to get behind and they fall down lower and lower till all of a sudden they're below the poverty line. And when they get down there, that causes more crime to go up because there's, they, they don't have any other mm -hmm. choice. They, gotta, they have mm -hmm. to rob. So there's a pretty fair amount of more crime there. Now, that being said, that's the bad point, I checked that against New York City. I was looking at the numbers because comparable size cities. New York 16, Buenos Aires 15, the numbers are pretty much the same. The difference is most of the crime in Buenos Aires is theft and robbery and that type of stuff. The odds of somebody whacking you over the head or shooting you or whatever is nowhere near. I think it was like, I don't know, a third of what New York City is. Violent crime. Violent crime, yeah. So. And if you're traveling to Argentina, just like traveling anywhere, you've got to be mindful of where your wallet is, keeping yeah. your pocket zipped up, you yeah. know, have your hand on your bag. Like, yeah. you know, you've got to be mindful of those things traveling anywhere. Yeah. But I would just like to say that it was years ago when we were in BA last time, but we were definitely finding ourselves in places that were deemed to be not the safest areas it to was, be in. It was nothing. And, well, maybe we were lucky. I don't know. But we actually never really had that feeling of being unsafe. And yeah. I remember we talked about it then, too. Yeah. Actually, our friends, when they came to pick us up with their car, they, oh, yeah. they're going to look like, <laughs> What are you doing staying here? I'm like, what do you mean by staying here? I'm right by the, I'm right by the pink house, which is their white house. So it's like, I'm by the white house. That's got to be great, you know? Uh, no, no, this is, this is, this is a seedy area yeah. over here. It's like, really? I, uh, I didn't know the hotel was great. And, you know, then actually we moved to another one on the main, on the main drag, right by the uh, obelisk, which is this huge thing that looks like the Washington Monument, right dead in the middle of this giant avenue. It's really cool. And mm -hmm. it was funny because the Hillary, 9th of July. Hillary Clinton had been in that hotel like a few weeks uh, before we got there. How bad could that be, right? Yeah. But even that was like only a block away from the seedy area. Nobody bothered us. Yeah. It was fine. Our friends yeah. had been there for a long time, you know, 10, 12, 13 years now, and, and nobody's robbed them. It just sort of depends on where you are. There's a couple yeah. bad areas. They do, I'm sure, remain mindful of the areas that they're in, and they're, they're careful. That's a downside, and, uh, you know, in the money, that you don't want your stuff in pesos, that's a downside. You mentioned the pink house a few minutes ago. Yeah. The pink house, as Pat mentioned, is like the White House in the U.S. This is the center of government in Buenos Aires. Uh, we happened to be staying, I guess, just a few blocks from the pink house at one point when we were in BA. In the CD area. And it just happened to be right at the point that Nestor Kirshner died. And the next morning, the helicopters were flying overhead. The people were gathering in the streets. I mean, okay, the 9th of July, we told you it's the widest street in the world. There was not a car driving down that street because the people were lined up all the way zigzagging, I don't know how far through the city, because they wanted to pay their last respects and they actually walked past the casket. You're probably wondering, well, who's Nestor Kirshner? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're going to be like, well, what's that guy? Well, yeah, yeah. He was the president of Argentina. So the president, picture of the president of Argentina dies, and then they put him in, he lies in state in, in the White House, which is the pink the house pink there. House. Because the whole, the whole building is pink, as, as you're looking at right now. This is the pink house. And it was crazy. It went on for days and days and days. These people lined up. And, and then his wife became... Christina. ...became the president afterward. Um, and, uh, and then I, seemingly, as we get the information, it's seemingly the country really started to go downhill. Um, the, you know, for, for her policies and also corruption, corruption that went on 
taking money, stealing, and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. I think Christina became popular because she was gifting things to the people. But as our friends tell the story, she was gifting them all right, but she would go to the local merchant, order 200 bikes or or a hundred of this or a hundred of that and she would deliver them to the people but she never paid the merchants so the merchants were actually the ones that were footing the bill for her generosity yeah okay this has taken probably way too long here we're, we're wasting a huge amount of your time although hopefully it's it's interesting to you anyway uh it's a really nice country and there was a lot of reasons to go there and a lot of reasons not to go there but what's going on now it's something where you should consider it on your radar because it's got a chance to be a really great country again if this guy pulls stuff off. Before the prices, before the popularity goes up and the prices start to follow suit. Remember earlier I was talking about making different choices at different ages? If I was 62 and retiring right now, as opposed to virtually 76 in a couple of weeks, I would seriously consider choosing Argentina and Buenos Aires versus any other country. There's a pretty good gamble now that the country is going to pull out of the malaise and, you know, and screwed upness that, it, that it's had. You have that chance where prior to that election, you didn't have any chance of that because the only way it was going was down. Now it could turn and come back up. And uh, we'll leave everything right there. So leave your comments about this too. I know this was a really long one and we're sort of bouncing around a little bit, but hopefully mm. we're throwing out new information all along the way that you're not gonna get, uh, you know, on a typical blog or, you know, other somebody else's website who's never been to these places. They never lived there. So they're, they're making stuff Yeah, up and whatever. here we are with inside information to share. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I hope that helped. Uh, thank you, as always, for subscribing. Uh, this whole channel has been way more than we ever thought it was going to be. And yes, thank you to all of our subscribers. You guys are amazing, really amazing. We appreciate you so much. So you want to sign off there, Gracie? Yes. Come back and see us again, please. <laughs> we'll look forward to it. Bye for now. Ooh.